Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our study in the book of Zechariah, as we look and review a couple of verses that we covered this last week and continue in this particular chapter, shall we thank our Heavenly Father for his guidance and direction and for the blessings that we are enjoying on these Sabbath hours. Shall we now ask for his guidance and direction by prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you for your direction, for your guidance, and for your watch care from the week that is past and for this day. Help us to be focused on this day. Direct us now. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to do. As we open your word, may our minds be readied for the seeds that are to be planted. May these seeds find fertile soil so we might consider more carefully that which your prophets have provided for us at this time. May your spirit help our minds to be open. May your angels attend us. And we ask, Father, that you grant us wisdom so that we might more clearly understand that which is written and apply it to what we're finding at this time in this earth's history. I ask a blessing upon each one that is attending this meeting. I ask also for a blessing for those that will view this later. Help us, guide us, and direct us in all things. May your will be done. May your name be praised. For this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. As we come back into this portion of Zechariah 7, we're dealing with the portion where Zechariah is reproving the hypocrisy of their fasts. We started covering this this last week. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land, and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh month, even though seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? Now, the thing that was pointed out in last week's study, what we will see when we come into Zechariah 8.19, we will be told the following. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness, and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love the truth and peace. Now, 457 is a number that we have on both of the charts. 4 times 5 times 7 times 10 gives us 1,400, which is 70 multiplied by 20. So is this 70 multiplied by 20 geras? Is this a symbol of something else that we should be addressing? Consider these things carefully. And when you did eat, and when you did drink, be not ye that did eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves. Now, are we doing these studies strictly for our own amusement? Are we doing this for our own edification? Are we doing this to prepare for what God would have us to do? Okay, well, a question. So, yes. so we we know that these uh, the fifth the fourth month that's going to be the ninth day of the fourth month, right? Okay. That you're going to have uh, the siege ends. That's when the walls of Jerusalem are going to come down, right? And that's going to be referred to in Ezekiel on the first day of the fifth month. Right, so on the first day of the fifth month, he's gonna. Or is it? To, I just forget which chapter it is. Deal with Tyre. Yeah. So in Ezekiel twenty-six one, it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first day of the month, that Tyre is going to mock. Right, that she is broken. So it's a reference to when the walls of Jerusalem were broken on the ninth day of the fourth month. So you got this fast in the fourth month. Now the fast in the fifth month, that's the 10th day of the fifth month. And then uh, the fast in the seventh month, we're not given a date for when, get all, when they celebrate, 
commemorate the death of Gedaliah. Okay. On his death, but that's going to be in the seventh month. And then uh, in the tenth month, that's a reference to the start of the siege. So it'd be the fast on the tenth day of the tenth month. So you have uh, the tenth day of the fifth month. Whether the fast is on the ninth day of the fifth month or on the tenth day of the fifth month is a dispute. Modern Judaism says it's the ninth day of the fifth month. But anyway, they're they're going to be fasting this period of 70 years, though it's not 70 years yet, right? So, so those fasts, would they have ended once the temple was rebuilt, or would they still continue those fasts? That's not something I, I – is this something they were to do for these 70 years? And then the other question would be, how do these become symbols – or how would we look at these as symbols in our time? Well, I mean, because you you know you took and you multiplied them together, the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth, you get fourteen hundred. So obviously, that's a symbol connected to the seventy years itself. But you got these twenties, right? This twenty fifth month, fourth month. We also have the fifth day of the fourth month. You know that that is a symbol. And the tenth day of the seventh month. So you could look at it here as you know four, five, seven, ten, tying together midnight and October twenty second, right? So like there's lots of different ways you could look at those symbols, but I, I know that's a lot of questions. But I, I guess the first question just dealing with um um did they continue these fasts afterwards? Because they're supposed to be for 70 years that they fast. Well, the point at which this is being written, was this not provided in the second year of Darius? Um, this part's in the fourth year. Okay. Right? Because if you look at uh, verse 1, it says the fourth year of King Darius, right? That the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, which is kind of interesting because that's an inversion of the ninth day of the fourth month, right? The day that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down. But here, of course, this is uh, the ninth month, which is Kislev. And um, and then uh, it says that they fasted in uh, the fifth month and the seventh month. So those two are going to be mentioned here. In chapter 8, there's going to be mentioned also the fourth and the tenth month. But here the focus is upon uh, the destruction of the temple, which occurred in the fifth month, and the seventh month, the commemoration of of the death of Gedaliah. And also the fact that, you know, in the seventh month, there normally was a fast, you know, the tenth day of the seventh month, which they cannot keep that feast, right? They can't uh, have a day of atonement because there is no temple. So that could also be part of that, but we know the Gedaliah uh, commemoration of his his assassination is also part of this. So we have this taking place about 518 BC. <clears throat> yeah. So you're going to have um, this. Is, so you're saying in in the ninth month. Uh, so you're going to have it as, I'm just going to get this date. Yeah, so it's going to be ninth month. Yeah, so it's it's in November. Making sure I'm doing this right. No, it's in December. Yeah, so December 7th, 518 BC. Yeah, on the Julian calendar. Okay. Kind of interesting as you would, as you would look at that. If that's December seventh on the Julian calendar. Yeah. In world history at this point, December seventh on the Gregorian calendar means something else entirely. Yeah, well it's the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Right. It's also the birthday of my first wife. Ah. Okay. But it's also twelve times seven twelve times seven eighty four that's on the top right hand corner of the eighteen forty three chart. Right. right. Seven Times 12 equals 84. Times 30 equals 2520. So we have that at the upper right, 
do we not have that at the lower right on the 1850 chart? Or am I missing something? Um, no. Okay. They don't do that calculation on the 1850 chart. Okay. It's, it's only on the 1843 chart that they do the 7 times 12. Okay. Now. 1843 chart, they do that, yeah. Yeah, so it's just we have lots of symbols here being used. And, of course, the main point is that most people don't recognize that this is the 70 years for the temple is being specifically marked out prior to that period of time ending. Right. Right. So, you know, the fact that the angel is going to say 70 years, you know, for it in the second year of Darius and 70 years in the fourth year of Darius, when both of them have not been a period of 70 years yet, is is just something that is completely ignored by everyone. Right. So either people think it's a reference to the Babylonian captivity or they just don't really think about what how that where that period of 70 years, why it would be referred to as 70 years, even though it had not yet been 70 years. And so that means it must already be predetermined to be a period of 70 years prophetically. So so I would say that there is there's something here regarding uh, the understanding that we presently have of these prophecies that are a message to be understood in connection with the spiritual rebuilding of the temple in our history. That um, yeah. So there, there's lots there. I mean, I just have never found anyone who's ever noticed this. Is this like, the, is this the um, is this before? Before Babylon or after when he's writing this? Is this before or after he? This is 70 years after the temple was destroyed. Well, it's actually 68 years. And um, that so he's this writing is when Zachariah in chapter 7. Was... Yeah, Babylon has fallen a long time ago. Like Cyrus's decree was 18 years earlier. Okay. So it's oh, 18 okay. years after Cyrus's decree. So it's 518. Right. When he get, issues its, his decree, Ellen White says it's more than 20 years between Cyrus's decree and Darius's decree. All right. And it's, that less than 20, and it's less than 20 years from when the Jews return under Cyrus's decree to Darius's decree. So that places Darius's decree in the summer of 516. So, well, between the spring and the fall of 516. So that would be the summer. So Zechariah is writing this during captivity. No, captivity has been over for 18 years. Okay, so he's doing it under the Medes and the Persians. It's under the Persians, yeah. He's Darius okay. is is the Persian. So it's not Darius the Mede, it's Darius the Great, Darius Hystaspes. Okay. Yeah. Is oh. so so. Uh, both Haggai and Zechariah are prophesying in the time of Darius, and they're going to start their prophesying in the second year of Darius. And, and then that, that prophesying is going to start the building of the temple again, because it had been stopped under Paul Smyrtus. Who and this is, Darius. I'm sorry, this is during the time period of Daniel too, right? He's, he's in that time period, right? Daniel's dead for like 20 years. Okay. 18 years or whatever. Yeah, because Daniel finishes his prophecy, his his work uh, in Daniel chapter 10, and that's going to be 18 years before this, before Zechariah chapter 7. So we, we believe Daniel's passed away quite a while before this. So, yeah, so the temple had been destroyed in the time of Daniel. Right. right now we're in the time of of uh, Ze Zechariah and Haggai. That's going to be the the time of Darius. So, so you saying the seventy years, years is, the seventy years has already been has already the seventy been. years of the Babylonian captivity had ended nineteen years before this. Okay. All right. Right, because the Babylonian captivity is going to end in five thirty seven, and we're in 518 so that's 19 years i was just trying to get my hair wrapped around yeah yeah that's good you're asking because some people might be confused 
uh, not not being sure what we're talking about. So yeah, so the Babylonian captivity is over. So that 70 years that's being referred to is not the Babylonian captivity. It's the 70 years for the temple. And we saw it in chapter one as well. So 60, uh, uh, or yeah, so 66 years after the destruction, the angel's going to refer to it as a period of 70 years. And then 68 years after the destruction of the temple, in here, in this chapter, the angel is going to refer to it as 70 years as well. So it's the same period of 70 years, and that 70 years has not yet ended. That's not the 70 years Babylonian captivity. It's the 70 years for the temple. So this is one of the basis for understanding that uh, Leviticus 26 is fulfilled by literal Israel with these periods of 70 years that end with decrees. Right? So there's a decree... Cyrus's decree that's connected with the end of the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. And then Darius's decree ends the 70 years for the temple. Kind of interesting when you're, when we start looking at this, using Stephen's table of history, mm -hmm. because on page 44, he lines out these periods of 70 years. Yeah. Where you have the first 70 years being from the time that Manasseh was taken captive to the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. Right. So that's going to be a period of probation because he's going to be taken captive 420 years after Saul is anointed. And then they have 70 years in which to reform. So that's the first seven times, right? Breaking the pride of your power. Right. And 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 then um, and then we're going to see that Daniel's taken captive at the end of that period, and so they have that opportunity for reform under the first seven times. But if they're not reformed by those things, then he will prolong that period by adding another seven times. That's the Babylonian captivity. Right. So that's that's wild beasts robbing you of your children. Daniel being taken captive, one of the children. And um, so that makes a period of 140 years, and that's going to end connected with Cy Cyrus's decree, right? So Cyrus is going to come to the throne. That ends technically the period. But six months later, he's going to issue the decree that allows the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. And then so we can see there there's a period of 490 years to the center of those 70 years, right? So we have like a chiasm, right? With the center of it being Daniel's captivity, 70 years from Manasseh's to Daniel's and then from Daniel's captivity to the end of the Babylonian captivity. And um, so, this so that's a period of 140 years altogether that ends with Cyrus's decree. And then from when uh, Jehoiachin's taken captive in 597 to Artaxerxes decree is 140 years. So that's so that period for Jehoiachin is a doubled. It's it's his period is doubled. It's not a period of 70 years. It's a period of 140. And then the fourth seven times, which is um, dealing with the destruction of the temple. That's going to be a period of 70 years. So you've got four different periods of time connected to each of the four seven times. And they're all going to end with a decree. Right. So that's what I had figured out in 2014 initially and then refined it, got the dates all sorted out by 2016 or actually 2013. I got the dates sorted out by 2014. So in 2013, both Jeff and I had noticed the four seven times we presented them at the same camp meeting. And then in 2014, I presented the chronology of it. Yeah. So I had to work it out for another year before it was so I was gonna ask this seventy years in this first right year. That's started at the Cyrus the decree. Right. That seventy years begins with the destruction of the temple. Okay, destruction of the temple. Okay. Yeah, destruction of temple and Jerusalem, right? So okay. that that period in five eighty six. Yeah. So it's okay. the seventy years for the temple and and the temple was destroyed 420 years after it was dedicated, 
right after it was built. And then it's going to be um, uh, restored after 70 years laying in ruins. So it's go the temple is going to rest. It's going to keep Sabbath just like the land did. And if you think about it, the temple existed for 420, that's six times 70. And then it's going to rest for 70. So, so that okay. keeping of the Sabbath of the temple uh, is connected to Leviticus 26. That's all about uh, the sabbatical cycles being used as periods of judgment. Okay. So from the time Jehoiakim is taken captive to Artaxerxes' decree gives you your 140, as you just addressed. Yeah, yeah. so Jehoiachin to Artaxerxes' decree is 140, yeah. So we have the pride of the power or the kingship coming under judgment. We have 70 um, years. Yeah. We have 70 years in which the land is to rest and have its Sabbaths. Mm-hmm. Now you have 70 years in which the temple is destroyed to the point where the temple is then decreed to be rebuilt. Yeah, when they're going to dedicate it. Yeah. Okay. Or you could look at the decree itself, I guess. It's 70 years and then another seven months until it's dedicated. But it's within the same Jewish year. Okay. Right, because it's going to be in the 12th month that it's going to be dedicated. So we have King. We have land, yeah. we have temple, and then people. From the book of Daniel, we have the people. Yeah, so so each of those four seven times address um, address this um, these symbols, right? The kingship, the the people, uh, the land, and and the uh, the temple. Okay. I got that all. Now, how do these apply to us? <laughs> well, that's a huge question. Yes, right? it is. Because, so, I mean, first we would have to look at at how it applies to these promises that go all the way back to the first gospel promise, right? The promised seed, and and we can see that these these blessings and curses are an expansion of that. Correct. Okay. Right. So what we see in Leviticus 26 with the blessings, which are primarily associated with the land, right, the sabbatical rest of the land. But tied to those are is is the birthright. People understand what I'm talking about. Right. So the birthright has it, you know, the kingship, the priesthood and uh, the double portion. Right. OK, so these are, you know, first promised um you know, in the promised seed, and then they're expanded on as time goes on to be more well-defined. And we're going to see when Jacob uh, blesses his 12 sons, he's going to give the priesthood to Levi. Doesn't doesn't say it directly, but Levi is going to be scattered, right, which is going to end up that Levi is going to be scattered because he's the priest. The kingship to Judah and the double portion to, to Joseph through his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And so these all become these types that then with the nation of Israel are, are going to be fulfilled in these periods of judgment. But we know that uh, once those periods end in 457, another period begins of 490 years. So we've had two other periods of 490 years. And this 70 weeks is going to end with the stoning of Stephen. And um, so that's going to make a transition of these blessings and curses from literal Israel to spiritual Israel. And then we're going to see that the 2300 days uh, extends uh, the sanctuary to be cleansed in the Millerite time period. So, so we can't ignore all of that when we start to look at how it relates to us, right? Because we are Seventh-day Adventists, which is raised up from that Millerite uh, time period. So God has raised up a people, a church. We went through four generations of a progressive destruction of four to 1989. This movement is proclaiming a message that first is begun, was arrived in 1989. And then it, the, when, then the second angel arrived, of course, at 9-11. So 
So this movement, we're tied to this. But then we also, are you asking more like on a personal level, how does that relate then to a personal level? And I would say that that personal level relates to the larger picture, that you can't separate it out. I don't know if that answers your question. It's a pretty long answer. Well, all of this that we have been looking at, as we are observing the history, if we are going to apply this, then history is to have a repetition. Right. And so we're in a part where this message of Zechariah and Haggai, dealing with the rebuilding of the temple, definitely apply to us who are Seventh-day Adventists at a time in which we see that Adventism has failed its mission, right, as an institution, but that God is going to restore it in some way, right? You understand what I'm saying? Not totally, no. Well, so we know that this message, you know, we can look at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, like as I studied last night, and we see what M.L. Andreessen was trying to address in that his disappointment really of what had happened with the church in how they dealt with the book Questions on Doctrine. So we know the church is in apostasy, and it's part of prophecy. I mean, we're paralleling the history of the Jews. So now we have a message. The message that we're giving is the message of Zechariah and Haggai, that the temple needs to be rebuilt. Right. Right. Now, we know that this is a spiritual temple. It's not made out of stones. You know, the evangelicals, the Pentecostals, the dispensationalists who are looking for like a third temple to be rebuilt as a fulfillment of prophecy are looking at a building. But we know that that's not that's not correct. Right. That that this building is not made with stones, but is a living temple that needs to be built. And so so this is talking about a message to us. Now, can we say that um, false murders has stopped the building of the temple and that there's there's a message here of Zechariah and Haggai to to encourage the people to continue to rebuild the temple? And that the symbols that are associated with it are the symbols of this movement. All right. right. I mean, I mean, we could all be just deluded, you know, right? We could all just be, you know, that this is way beyond, uh, like we're putting ourselves in somewhere in history that we don't belong because of our misinterpretation of prophecy. That, that's the way that most people have approached what happened with July 18th. Is they say, well, we were wrong, and so, and, and and different responses are going to happen to that, right? Some people are just going to go back to the world. Some are going to go back to the church. Some are going to still be involved in some kind of fanaticism, you know, offshoot or so forth, right? Some are going to sort of uh, be you know, persisting in in trying to reapply the time prophecies. We just got the wrong date, or or something like that, or we need to be looking for a future date. And and we've taken the position that we're paralleling Millerite history, which had to do with the start of the 2300 days, or or the the start of the Day of Atonement at the end of the 2300 days and the cleansing of the sanctuary, and that we're dealing with prophecies in our line, dealing with the close of the Day of Atonement, right? So the close of probation when Christ is going to confess the sins upon the head of the scapegoat. And so, you know, it, it's pretty solemn if you think about the fact that we are actually proclaiming a message that from what we have studied is the message that is a parallel to the message of Zechariah and Haggai. I think we have to be proclaiming this message. Yeah. Yeah, so and and so we're still struggling with, you know, what does that mean? Like what is it that we are to do? Or at least I know I'm struggling with it. And and all I can see is that, you know, God just asks us to keep doing what we're doing. But you know, there's another part of me that says, well, you know, I should be doing something more. 
And so you think about it, well, when you eat and drink, did you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? So the question that we would have to ask is, is what does this mean? So if we're we're taking this eating and drinking as studying, right? All right. Okay. I was going to so ask, are we doing this just for ourselves? Okay, William? I was going to ask a question about verse 24 in Daniel 9. Okay. That's the 70 weeks that that Babylon is that's 70 weeks when Babylon took over, right? 70 years? I mean, it says 70 weeks. Where? 924. 24. Oh, Daniel 924. Okay, yeah. I didn't catch which book you were talking about. I thought you said Jeremiah. No, Daniel. No, it's nothing to 70 weeks have nothing to do. That's just it's the coming. period of time. Like, I don't understand what you're asking. I was just going to ask, is that the, the 70 weeks, is that the, is that the time period when Babylon took over Israel? When it no. came in? Huh? No. Babylon's okay. long gone. Okay. Like that's 490 years. It has nothing to do with Babylon. The 70, there's 70 years for Babylon, but there's no 490 years for Babylon. But they are tied together. The Babylonian ca captivity is tied symbolically to the 70 weeks because the reason we have the Babylonian captivity for 70 years is that for 490 years, the Jews had neglected the sabbatical rest of the land. So basically for 70 weeks from the, the anointing of Saul to the captivity of Daniel, that 490 years, they're not observing the sabbatical rest of the land. And so the 70 years captivity is going to be connected to that keeping those Sabbaths that they didn't keep for 490 years. So then the prophecy given to the Jews uh, as a probationary period is going to be 490 years. They're going to be given another 490 years to make things right, to, to repent. But at the end of that 490 years, they're going to close their probation with the stoning of Stephen. Okay. All right. Now, the question. I, mean, I know that Roy has. Not, um, Go ahead, Angela. Angela, you were going to say something? I can't hear you. Okay. Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity and the cities thereof round about her? when men inhabited the south and the plain. So are these not the words that the Lord has, has cried by the hand of the former prophets? That's an alternate translation. Right. Yeah, I would I would give a different translation. Then how would you do it? So uh, he has here, should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried? So you can see that there's some added words there. They're trying to make sense out of, the sentence right and so they're going to say are not these are, are not these the words which the lord has no, cried by the hand of the former prophets so I, I would actually say ye have not heard the words which the lord hath cried by the former prophets right that's how i would translate it not it's more direct words. what i said that's much more direct yeah. Now, now part of the problem here in Hebrew has to do with tenses, right? Because they only have a completed and incomplete tense. So I would just say, you know, you have not heard the words. Um, so I'm not sure why they would put, are these not the words? Uh, are not these the words? Well, my translation don't have these. Yeah, I know. But he has, this is an alternate translation he has here from okay. 1769. King James Version, they give an alternate reading. Are not these the words? And um, in Young's literal translation, he's going to say, are not these the words, right? The problem here is these would not be part of the sentence, right? Okay. And, and the question is, what is the, is it the words that are not, or is it their hearing that is not? Um, so in the King James you have not heard the words which uh, the Lord have cri has 
cry by the hand of former prophets. And that's what I would think it, it should be. You've not heard these words. But you can see here is an added word and should. So it, it's just kind of a, a, it's sort of an incomplete sentence, not the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets. Right? So, so they put it, should ye not hear, right? And I said, ye have not heard. That is, that you've negated the words which the Lord has cried by the former prophets. That's how I would take it. But, you know, the alternate translation is okay. It's just I wouldn't have translated it that way. Doesn't mean I'm right. But. Okay. Well, does it change the meaning of it? Not really. I don't think it's so. It's just either. that I would say that it's it's a stronger thing that basically they have not heard. Where they, This is more like a hypothetical or um, a rhetorical question. Right. But, but it's really about whether they've... Uh, listen to these words or not. So the question is, so when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity and the cities around there of around about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain. So, so there is a time that these words were not heeded, right? That's the main point of it. Right. When everything was going good, we didn't listen to the word that was cried by the prophets in the past. That's what I got from it, too. So. And, and that's why I think it is, you know, it, the, the point of this is that this movement is being called back to heed these words. And oh, so Angela says her Internet went down when she was trying to find out whether Zechariah 7, 6 is a question or an observation or command in the alternate Dwight has. I know this for yourselves is supplied. So, okay. Yeah, so it's a little bit difficult sometimes in Hebrew to figure some of these idiomatic sort of sentence structures, right? Because they're not. Uh, well, it still gives the same impression that you eating you you eating the word of God and not sharing it, or drinking it and not sharing it, right? You you holding it to yourself instead of giving it to somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a better way that Zechariah seven six should be should be interpreted? Okay, um, when do you, when you did eat and when you did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Right. So one is you can see for yourselves are added words. Right. So I mean, literally, when you did eat and when you did drink, did ye not eat and drink? <laughs> right. If you if you take those added words out, so so these are are sort of um, and and the question is whether it's and when you did eat and when you did drink, be not ye they that did eat for yourselves or drink for yourselves. Yeah, it's a, th these are tough kind of things to translate in Hebrew. To me, it's almost asking as if they were, you know, holding themselves up above that of God, that they weren't really worshiping, that they were more being the kind of people that thought that they were better than those around them. Yeah, but so I'm not so certain that this these either of these are good translations. Okay. You know, because I'm just looking at the Hebrew here. Uh so well, you, you um, have the verse in you had the verse in Revelation that where it, it's a revelation where it says, eat, no, it's the little book in Daniel 10, right? Where it says, you, you eat it, and it's like, it, it was a sweet to your mouth, and then it comes, then it becomes bitter. I'm probably, my thinking probably wrong, so I just, I just, I apologize if I interrupted you. Well, you're fine. Mm. This is, this is a really difficult sentence to translate. Which is why I can see they're they're having problems. I, I think it's something to the effect, okay, because because there there's the fast in the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth month. But here he's going to refer to the fifth and seventh month in verse five. And then were you fasting unto me? So the reason why they put for yourselves is in contrast to that, right? So did ye fast unto me? To me, right? Um, so, I mean, the question is even, did they really actually fast? I apologize, it's in Revelation chapter 10, not Daniel chapter 10. Yeah, and, and, 
And I don't know why they double the unto me, unto me. Now, when they have the fast, the fast is doubled, right, in the Hebrew. Right. So fast is mentioned twice. And then they say unto me, even to me. I'm not sure why they double that because it's not doubled. So they double the me to me, right? But they don't double the fast, right? Did you at all fast? Like, this is kind of awkward sentence. So I'm not really what sure what this all means. The way that I would look at it is during this period of fast, uh, they were, were they actually really fasting? I think is the question. So they should have been fasting, but it doesn't seem like they were is what I would gather from it because they are going to eat and drink when they should be fasting. But are they fasting for show or are they fasting to draw closer to God? Well, I'm saying they're not fasting at all. There is these fasts that are proclaimed, but they're not fasting. That's the way that I would interpret this. So when, 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 when they ate and drank, when they should not have eaten and drank, but but I could be wrong. But it's it's. Uh, well, not thank you, Moses. This this is something I'd have to spend a bit more time on. But it 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 it's very awkward Hebrew. It's not it's not um, easy to translate. But you know other translations. So if you look at um, you know if you look at all the different translations on 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 these verses, like for instance, wow, there's some quite different translations. Okay, so we're going to have to go back. Okay. So most translations are going to be, you know, saying that it's for yourselves. But when you ate and drank, uh, was it not you that were eating and drinking? And when you did eat and drink, didn't you not eat for yourselves? So, so the idea is that they're doing, they're eating and drinking for their, for their own benefit, I guess, is really, so that, that idea is there that they're going to eat and drink, but their purposes in eating eating and drinking is is self-centered. But the question is, is that after the fast or is that during the fast that they're eating and drinking, I guess, is the question. So one translation, which uh, that that sort of would fit, it says, when you fasted with mourning in the fifth and seventh months, even these 70 years, did you keep the fast to me? And and the question there would be, were you really actually fasting, right? So if we were going to apply that to this movement, how would we apply that to this movement? Like if we're going to take eating and drinking having to do with spiritual food. Okay, so if we're going to if we're going to make this a a spiritual application, if we were truly eating and drinking in the Word. Would we not have become more unified? Would we not have had more patience with other brothers and sisters? Yeah. Well, so if we look at the, the history of this movement, when we're we're making these, especially when we're making these predictions, November 9th, um, I mean, to me, it's it's the darkest period of this movement from my perspective. Right. Is that you have an opportunity for the movement to come together, for people to be humbled, to work together. But the infighting comes to, let's say, a fevered pitch where all kinds of jealousies are in play. You see Parminder. Everybody's fighting for position. And the casualty is the truth, right? The movement then unites under the July 18 proclamation, but it's all self-centered, Highly right. self-centered. What's that? Highly self-centered. Yeah, right. You know, there's there's all this infighting is going on, all of this politics behind the scenes. And and then we see once the disappointment happens, we see manifested the characters that were, were for a time sort of hidden, right? So we could say that that's a period of fasting, right? When we should be fasting, but but we're not really because there isn't true repentance happening. Right. And and so the question is, how are we going to, you know, respond now? Because we we have this situation where 
God is calling us to examine ourselves. You know, were, were we really sincere in what we were professing to believe? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's very interesting, this section, dealing with this this question of the 70 years, the symbols attached to it, that they attach to the symbols of this movement. And then, you know, the question about the eating and drinking. Which, which I believe obviously has to be applied to, to studying God's word, eating the little book, and drinking of His Spirit. Okay. So, when we were when we're going to to close, since we're at Zechariah seven seven, we're at the doubling. Yeah. Are these not the words which the Lord hath cried by the hand of the former prophet, when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity? And the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain. So we need to be asking ourselves, what is important about this verse that has a doubling applied to it? It's not only seven, but seven, seven. And what is this going to mean for us at this time? Now, the first sentence of what Mrs. White had presented on this portion, Mm -hmm. to the Jewish nation was committed the oracles of God, and they were commanded to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Never were they to depart from the instruction given them by Christ from the pillar of cloud. This statement offers us a pattern that we should have been following. And that the movement should have followed and has not followed. Mm-hmm. And this will be the point to which we will return this coming week. Does anyone else have any comments or questions with what we have been addressing? Well, I notice it says uh, the hand of the prophet, a former prophet. It, that implies they're active. I know this sounds stable, so it might go down again. But anyway, I thought I'd ask that. Okay. I mean, doing along with preaching, right? Living, living the message, not just spouting it. I think that's what he's saying. Right. I couldn't disagree. So we're going to continue in this section this coming week. Any other thoughts or comments? Then let us close our, our study with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, there are many things that have been presented by prophets of old that we have not followed. Help us now, Father, guide us so that which is done may bring glory to your name. Direct our steps, direct our thoughts, direct our words today. Help us so that that which is done may be to your glory and not to ours. Be with us through this Sabbath. Direct us now. For this, we thank you and this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.